Hail, hail, the Celtics are here, and what the hell do we care now? It is just the final derby match before the split, and, and a league title race, Josh, that I think is taking us kind of all by surprise at how tight it's going all the way to basically the very end, the bitter end, eh, as it is in Glasgow quite often. And we're here again on the Celtics are here for the flagship podcast this week to talk everything Celtic, the aftermath of Livingston, preview Rangers, and whatever squeezes in between. I'm Quinny. And I'm joined, as, as always, by Josh. Josh, good to see you, mate. Hail, hail. Good to see you. Good to be back. Good to be back in the pod. Obviously, a, a tense week uh, since Sunday. Even before Sunday, I would say all the chat's been about the derby, so we'll, we'll add further fuel to the fire today, I'm sure. But should be a good one. All roads lead to Ibrox, it seems, and it's, it's a massive game. One of the biggest league derbies in a while. So, looking forward to it. Yeah, well, it's going to be one of the... The thing about the derby games is that it's like, you look forward to it right until, like... Yeah. The last minute, and then it's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, look on a roller coaster or something. You're like, no, no, I changed my mind. I don't, <laughs> don't want this game to happen quite yet, you know, um, for one reason or another. But normally, the couple of games before the derbies do give us an indication of tempo, form, who might be playing, and all the rest yeah. of it. So, the Livingston game at the weekend was always going to give us some indications on where the manager has some of the players in the pecking order, as well as like the fitness levels of of everything else so I do think the Livingston game actually gives us a lot of food for thought and a lot of insight into maybe how we're going to shape up against them and you know like what the the path for the team currently is at the moment I think the big headline the weekend of course was seeing Hitate come back into the starting 11 which was a real breath of fresh air it really did feel like we had a lot of tempo a lot of pace in midfield and a lot of the other players that will come on to talk to talk about I'm sure that did well in the game felt like they all enjoyed that extra kind of zip and zest that mm -hmm. we kind yeah. of had in build up definitely definitely Hitati massive that he's back in the team I actually forgot you forget how good he is uh, when he actually comes in and the difference he makes to the side is is unreal I, I expected them to start um, if I'm honest I wrote an article for the site last week and I done the predicted 11 for the game and I got 11 out of 11 so happy days hopefully That's Rogers it. same again same again at the weekend Brendan but yeah Hitati he, he's just so good even like when he gets those balls and like run about the halfway line and see Iwata plays a line breaking pass um, to, to break the press even and uh, Hatati just plays one touch bang out wide to a Dizen or out on the other side to Kuhn just makes such a difference having that quickness and the tempo and the, and the control in the game that he brings in the first half for me as well he looked like one of the only players who was not trying because everyone was but stood out in the first half taking shots making big actions like he was and the second half obviously he gets used to the world went down as an own goal but it was Hatati that kind of forced the issue so yeah very positive to see him back in the team and at the minute it just feels like Celtic are coming on to form at the correct time this season we've not really seen us have a consistent run of victories and performances yes we've had a run of wins but we've not had a run of performances where it's been good I feel like we've had that over the past couple of weeks and past couple of games and that's only positive as well you look at the players that are coming back like Obviously, Tati, everyone in the squad, bar McGregor at the minute, seems to be fully fit. I think Cameron Carter-Vickers has completed 90 minutes on that plastic pitch at the weekend was was massive and something that shouldn't be overlooked because we know the issues he's had all the campaign. So I think there's a lot of positives to take for that game at the weekend and obviously clean sheet, three goals scored. It was a bit nervy at half time. I was there, I could feel the kind of nerves within the support, a bit of frustration as well, given half time, now, now, it's a game you should be romping. Yeah, uh, away at Lovey, but nah, come through and, and managed to manage to do well. But yeah, going back, Hitati brilliant. He has to for me he has to start uh Aye Brooks because having him for see you start him, you get 60, 65 minutes out of him like you did at the weekend, 70 minutes. And what he brings in that space of time is next to none and what a lot of no other players in in the, the country can even bring. So I think he has to start the weekend as well. Yeah, him being back totally, for me, kind of wakes up the midfield, kind of shakes it up yeah. in a lot of different ways as well, because Pelo Bernardo also comes off the bench and gets a goal, and the transfer rumours around, you know, what his status will be, you yeah. know, for, for next season, it kind of keeps in the discussion. But I think, like, Bernardo, there's nothing terribly, like, he doesn't let you down. He's not, like, yeah. you know, a, a bomb scare or crap or anything like that. <laughs> He's just not that distinct, you know, and when you see somebody like Hitati that can come into the midfield yeah. uh, and because like I'm looking at the, the the way the team shaped out against Livingston, having the likes of, you know, your own youth prospects, we spoke about this last week, like giving your own kids an actual chance yeah. rather than 
loaning kids in to give someone else's academy products a chance. Yeah. You, you've got the likes of Kelly and maybe one or two others home and, you know, whatever floating around there to supplement the likes of O'Reilly mainly, you know, then the extra midfielder, I think like what Hitati really should show Celtic, the board, the, the transfer committee, maybe even the fans as well. It's just like, that's the that's what's missing in our midfield is more creativity, yeah. more creation. Bernardo, yeah. who can move the ball left to right, can be quite strong in the middle, doesn't do anything bad or, you know, whatever. Yeah. That's fine. But we've got McGregor. We've got Iwata, you know, like, yeah. I don't, I, you know, I know he can pop up with a goal once in a while. I don't know how many he's got for us now, maybe three. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I think Hitati coming back really does shake it all up. And really, like, looking at this midfield three here, Hitati, Iwata and O'Reilly, like, I know Iwata can maybe split opinion at, at Livingston, but I think if that's the midfield three that starts and we get a you know, good result as I can imagine we could get, that might be, it might be really hard for McGregor to get back into that team because I know mm. when people say McGregor's, like I heard, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts and stuff like that, like, like I do, and uh, I, I get the time. And McGregor's not the best fitting midfielder in, you, you mm -hmm. could ask for. You know, he's probably arguably the best we have, if you know what I mean. But McGregor's not a great sitting midfielder. You kind of actually want McGregor to do Hitati's job when Hitati's yeah. not been around. And he's had little shots at it, and he's okay. He really Similar to maybe some other players, I think McGregor needs reps in a role to really mm. maximise himself, you know, going from that position to that position and all the rest of it. I don't think he, you get the most out of him, sadly. But I think what Iwata gives you in that position... He just yeah. eats up those balls. He just, and I know like when he was at centre back the other week, he could, oh, he's not that defensively, whatever, but he had two guys on him, you know, but in that midfield spot where he can just firefight, Hitate and O'Reilly are going and doing their thing and he's just sitting, guarding the guarding the castle, running around left to right, I say, putting things out. Mm -hmm. You don't get that from McGregor as much, you know, and Iwata, yeah. by the way, over the last two or three games, he's had more chances to score than you would see McGregor getting chances to score in matches. So mm -hmm. even from that position, he's not as shy as McGregor is to go and break a line with a run or overload if he sees a chance. So, you know, like, I think this midfield three could do amazing against them. You know, we'll talk about how they'll line up or whatever, but I think having that proper combative, like six defensive mid, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, maybe opens up way more of the team. Yeah, uh, yeah I think I agree with you on a lot. I, I really do. And I, I thought he had a really good game at the weekend, just like you say, breaking up the play and, and that's what he always does, you know, he's, he's reliable in terms of that. I just think if McGregor's fit, whether or not we agree with it or not, I think he's going to play. He's, yeah. he's captain, and we know what he's done in Derby, he's gone by. You look at wins, like the one at New Year, I thought he played really well in that game. It was one of his best performances on Celtic shot. And two years ago today, I think it was actually, he came up on Twitter that we beat Rangers 2-1 at Ibrox. Uh, the one where Cameron carver scored the winner that day, I remember McGregor being outstanding especially for the opener, uh, not the opener, the equaliser, when he just made that run from about the edge of the D all the way into the Rangers box and Tom Rogic eventually scores from it. So he can bring that even when he is in that sitting role and he can make those runs forward and kind of take the shackles off himself at times. But is he the most effective in that role? Probably not. You're probably not getting the best out of him. And Iwata offers the press resistance etc is a lot of much more of a naturally defensive player because obviously he used to play centre back at times before he joined Celtic and he can play there uh, regardless of how people say he does I just think McGregor gets the nod if he's fit and just going by comments and press conferences and what's happened before he's the captain that I think there's no world unless McGregor's fit he plays like I would be very very surprised to see a midfield of Iwata Hitati and O'Reilly with McGregor on the bench. Like I could see Awata, Hitati, O'Reilly, and then McGregor not in the squad, but if he's on the bench, I'd be very surprised. It is very harsh, though, on Awata if McGregor gets the nod because he's been playing really well. He's finally got a consistent run of fitness and a consistent run of games in a Celtic shot, and he's probably playing the best he's ever played for us. I think a lot of people would probably agree with that. And to drop him in what is the biggest game of the season when he's just been on a good run of form is, is quite harsh. I seen, I think it was Stephen McGinn uh, on on a it was Go Radio the other day. Now he put out this wild suggestion that Celtic play four central midfielders, and they play McGregor, Awata, Hatate, and O'Reilly, and play like Hatate out in the right on the right wing. I was like, I don't know where he's got that suggestion from. I I would not go with that, but I think Awata drops out if McGregor's fit. That's the end of the story. I think McGregor, I'm you would be confident in him playing. Listen, he is. He's, 
the best midfielder in Scotland, in my opinion, when he's at his best and when he's playing where he is most suited to. And like he's he's done it in derbies before he offers he, that leadership. He's the captain of the side, and, and you want your captain fit when you're playing the biggest game of the season. So I'd, McGregor starts if he's if he's fit for me. I could see him starting on the bench, to be quite honest with you, because. Yeah. Yeah, if I'm not to make the squad, I know like the, the, the comments at the moment is like they'll kind of take it as this. I think the latest comment from Kennedy was like you'll be in training like mid this week and yeah. then they'll assess it and all that kind of jazz. Yeah. And you know, with the obviously we had that bounce game in the international window, uh-huh. mainly for the tatty is what I'm thinking, you know, especially when you see how the Livingston game shook out. So yeah. I think like that midfield three is what Rogers has been thinking for the last three weeks or something. This is what we try and get on the pitch for, for Ibrox. Yeah. And like if you're taking off rather than taking off a tatty for Bernardo, if you're taking off a tatty for McGregor, like yeah, it's way more powerful in the game, perhaps. So I wouldn't be surprised to see McGregor on the bench personally, but it depends on his fitness level. If he's a hundred percent fit, the manager's got a really difficult uh yeah. I, I, and again, if McGregor is a hundred percent fit, I could see uh Hitate starting on the bench rather than Awata. Yeah, to be quite honest with you, because yeah. I think like you need that tackler in there, you need a guy yeah. like in there who's gonna be a shield in this game. Yeah. Take could a card, be. you know. Yeah, it could be. That's that's a good shout. Actually, I didn't think of McGregor and maybe Hitati dropping to the bench. But listen, the fact we'd actually have getting to have these discussions now with the season we've had, like regarding injuries, etc., is <laughs> it's unbelievable. Like, yeah. we've got arguably five, I would say, midfielders who are probably a bit worthy of starting the game: Iwata, McGregor, Hitati, O'Reilly, and Paul Bernardo. I think anyone would be happy seeing any of those five. A combination of three of them. In the lineup, so we're getting to have these discussions, which is very, very positive. Uh, let's let's not beat around the bush because we've had so many troubles this season, and it's it's great to have these guys back fit and playing good football as well at the same time and, and doing well. So let's just hope the positive mood can continue can continue at the weekend. Yeah, for sure. I think like the midfield has been like the 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 understated problem in the team this yeah. season. Yeah. But the very clear problem in the team this season has been defence. And I couldn't believe Vickers get 90 minutes against Livingston. You mentioned it earlier. But yeah. I thought it would be getting the result, same as the week before, get him on the bench, yeah. bring on Welsh or Naroki or something. Yeah. But Denada, full 90 minutes for CCV. And I think like, that is a huge statement. Like he, it's, It kind of puts out from us to them, like he's not a weak link, you know, in uh, in that regard. Like we were all maybe, or I was especially thinking he was maybe like, you know, 80% right or whatever. But if you can get through 100 um yeah, the thick end of 100 minutes, I think that game was um, mm-hmm. on that pitch. Then he's uh, then th- that's a huge boost of confidence in the back four now with the goalkeeper is as tight and is as good as, good yeah. as it's been set up yeah. for this year, hasn't it? As well, yeah, it is. Yeah, definitely. Carl Vickers was massive that he's completed that 90 minutes. Like, you look at that's probably the best set in its defense uh, we have. Um, you look at well, maybe not skills, some will argue skills. The skills thing is. I don't know. Quinny's the big scale stand, scale, Liam scale CSC. Listen, I don't know. I'm not fully on the boat yet. Uh, I've not really been on the boat at any point this season. But listen, he's come in, he's done a good job. Brendan obviously trusts him, and having that trust of the manager is massive. So he's he's a key figure in that back line. He has been the whole season. Carter Vickers, though, is the main man. We know that. I, I'm with you. I expected to see maybe Welsh or Navrosky get the last half hour. Or, as soon as that Paolo Bernardo goal went in to make it 2 now, I was thinking, right, Carl Vickers is going to go off now. Especially on that pitch, anything can happen. And we know what Celtic's luck has been like throughout the season. Could have easily could have easily got another injury, but you know, thankfully he didn't. And yeah, the defence is is pretty strong at the minute. Obviously, Joe Joe Hart doing really well at the back. Like, listen, did you see the video of him um, after the game at the weekend? Just standing in front of the Green Brigade um, when the Celtic team done their kind of lap of honour of the Tony Macaroni, just standing there, taking it all in and just realising this is like his last seven or eight games in professional football and it's quite a poignant moment. It's really, it's good to see, but it's quite sad to see at the same time because he knows he's at the end of his time. But him spearheading that back line and Cameron Carter Vickers, the defence has looking good and a clean sheet of the weekend as well to boot. Although it's Livingston, we shouldn't, look over that because I feel when they came to Parkhead, they gave Celtic a really good game and they scored two goals. And I thought the threat of Tete Yenge before the game was going to be something that was going to cause Celtic a bit of trouble. And although it did, Livingston had like some four or five shots on goal the whole game. So the defence dealt with it pretty well. And the the last game at Ibrooks, Celtic played the 1-0 win. The defence was a big, big part of that. 
Lager Belka and Scales being the partnership. They had a brilliant, we each had brilliant performances that day, and that's what you need. You know, when you're going to a stadium like that, you know you're going to be under fire for certain parts of the game, and it's about how you how you overcome that. And defence getting that chemistry between them, it's a it's a solid back line that's got partnerships within it. It's it's positive to have that going into a game like this. Yeah, so I, I feel a lot better with the defence being what it's at yeah. as well. You know, that, that's yeah. a, a big thing coming in this game because, yeah. like you say, it's those calamities, it's those errors, and like. I know we can you know, we can talk about individual games, who caused what or whatever, but I think almost every time we've been at Ibrox, when we are, uh, over the last, let's say, two or three years, when we have been, like, defending, we're having to backtrack and run to our box or whatever, Yeah. when I when I do see McGregor as the first midfielder back, like, I don't have massive amounts of, you know, I know he's okay and stuff like that defensively. Yeah. I, I may be understating him a bit here, but, like, I don't get that same confidence of, like, oh, this is going to get snuffed out because... You know, things happen in these games, you know, and it is like a little slip ball or, you know, other things happen. So, you know, having a Wata in there, then that back four, Vickers and Scales, like, I just think that's a, that's a recipe for keeping the game tight and, you yeah. know, in our favour. Like, is I've not seen too much of them this year. I don't know. Uh, I think me and you, Josh, are pretty much the same, but mm -hmm. they have been really consistent in their selection and their formation and all the rest of it. And Clement's bringing a wee bit of a Euro ball to them, a wee bit of four two three one, yeah. pace in the wings, strong and sturdy in centre midfield, and then wing backs that go high to give you some width and try and stretch the game out. So it's it's important when you've got like one centre forward to play against as well as like three guys that will be operating in amongst them, mm -hmm. that that little, you know, that little uh, defensive wall, as it were, is as tight and as well organised as possible. Because this defence, I always fancy us scoring goals against Goldson and yeah. Stutter yeah. and all these guys, it's just it's just keeping them out is the hard bit or the the trick, you know, to get the yeah. result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I don't like you say. I've not watched much of them this season. I uh, don't like to talk about them too much, but they have. I've been doing alright since since the big man's come in. They've done okay and got results together. And like you say, playing pretty decent football. But their backline, honestly, I John Suter especially, and he come on for Scotland away at the Netherlands. Caused about two goals, well, one goal at least. I, I do not rate him at all. Goldson as well, he's not he's not the player he used to be. And there's a bit of debate over there, I believe, right now, about who's going to start the game. Is Yilmaz going to be fit? I don't want to eat my words, touch wood here, but if Barisic plays, I'd be a bit more confident uh, because, well, born a back post, he doesn't have that name for nothing. So they do have a bit of consistency. They're doing all right, but listen, I think player for player, Celtic are much a much better team than Rangers, but it's just about coming together as a team and, and showing that beat them twice this season. So that'll give the players confidence as well. And listen, this was all the talk going into the last game. Rangers on good form on an upturn. Celtic, a bit of the underdogs going into the last game, you could argue, and come through and win two one in a dominant performance. It wasn't a two one game, it was a three one. It was going on four one game if Celtic took the chances that day. So yeah. Turn up if Celtic turn up, they win the game. Celtic play to their strengths and they play to their best and play like they have been at the weekend. They win the game. But it's it's a question of can they? And that's always the question when you're playing against Rangers. It's can you turn up on Derby Day? And if you do, then you can reap the rewards. I think I, I think with the situation they're in where they have the pressure of like if you look at the table, we're a game ahead of them, you know. So yeah. they are technically in the driving seat for this at the moment. Yeah. You know, if they win the rest of their games, then it's their title to lose. In essence, that's yeah. the way you kind of need to look at it mathematically, as it were. But this is probably the best game for our attackers, you know, because mm -hmm. no other team is going to try and press us and camp us in our half, like yeah. Rangers will at Ibrox, you know. And when we couldn't come on a game, we yang attack, still uh, we yang gang. Still yep. kind of floating around, looking good again. And obviously, Kyogo and Maeda know this fixture really well. Mm -hmm. You can just see them flooding with pace. You brought it up before we came on, uh, the Benfica goal. Yeah. That they scored from like, their own corner. A couple of passes, yeah. rapid exactly. guy into space, yeah. you know. We could, yeah. we could do that a few times, couldn't yeah, we? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. That's something Celtic should look to capitalise on. Listen, I don't know how Rangers are going to set up for this fixture. If they're going to play that very high defensive line that they have been, but watching them a couple of times, limiting it to that the best I can. They have that exposure to, to the high ball over the top and playing players right in the halfway lane. And like you said, the Benfica goal, Rafa just ran right in behind. He was in his own half and that's how he managed to get the goal. Like you said, Nicholas Kuhn's playing really well at the minute, man of the match at the weekend. 
he does have pace to burn, as does the likes of Maeda. He's rapid. Kyogo can run in behind for you as well, and that's why I'm glad it's odds on that Kyogo's going to play the game instead of Adam Eda, because as much as people say he can cross balls into Eda and he's a big presence and he'll rough up the likes of Goldson and Suter, Goldson and Suter don't need roughed up. They are poor as it is for me. So to have Kyogo there, he'll be constantly pressing, posing a threat like he always does, and then Kuhn as well. Yang, even if Yang comes on second half, makes a difference. Happy days. And you've got Luis Palma, I read a report that he could be fit for the game, which could be big for Celtic as well. Obviously, been missing the past couple of weeks, and Forrest knows the fixture. Uh, he's only scored twice in it, but he knows it inside out. And you've got options everywhere across the pitch, it seems, at the minute. You've got a solid two, two, three players who could come on and make a difference. And the attack clicking into gear at the minute is really good. Although none of the front three scored at the minute. Uh, scored at the weekend, sorry. Some of the combinations were, were really good. In that first half, Kyogo had a fair few opportunities. One in the second half where Kuhn gets it in the right. Yeah, I think it was from an O'Reilly ball uh, out wide and he, and he crosses it in for Kyogo. Probably should have scored. Uh, Shamal George made a good save. So, listen, the, the front three now, it's a consistent front three because they've played the past few games, past two or three games now. And look at build those relationships and with the midfield, the creative players who are capable of playing the balls over the top. And Celtic could reap the rewards if Rangers are not too tight at the back. Yeah, big time. Uh, so I think, like in terms of the the main dilemmas coming into the weekend, you know, like you're saying there, Kyo goes odds on to play the game, and I'm I'm totally with you there. But maybe yeah. like a week ago or so, like Adam Eda was probably a much more viable alternative, whereas now it does feel like yeah. he's the supplementary yeah. option. You yeah, know, which is fine. Yeah. That's what we want, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. there's some chat over Eda and like Norwich, Sydney Van Hooydonk, and the whole kind of. You know the musical chairs situation of that whole kind of transfer yeah. cycle, as it were. Again, for the the fee we've got reported attached to Ida, he would need to come off the bench and score a hat trick for me right. to, yeah. to think about six million quid for him in the summer. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, Ida. It's it's a tough one. It's five goals in ten games and two assists. So seven goals and seven goal contributions in ten games from a January loan signing is is a good return. Uh, yeah, get away from that, but. Are you going to pay what is it? I don't even know. It's six, seven million. Is it something like that for, yeah. for that type of guy? You'd want him to be pushing Kyogo. Now he has pushed Kyogo a couple of times, but the form didn't last. But let's let's look look at the goals he has scored. They has scored some crucial ones. Hibs away was massive. Uh, the two penalties, although they were penalties, we don't have many players who are capable of scoring them. I know he's missed one since, but then Motherwell away, he done really well there, coming off the bench, scoring two goals at one Celtic the game. So he has made, he has had his impact and he and he's done very well so far. But Kyogo for me is offers a, a lot much more in terms of just pressing and things like that. A lot of people are divisive about it. I can understand why people want Ida to play at the weekend. But one guy I feel sorry for in this whole situation is Oh Hyun Gyu. He's just been bombed out like the past since January, since he's come back for the Asian Cup. He's played like one or two games, not even a master half an hour. I feel really sorry for him because before the, the winter break, he was a guy who was coming on and scoring and doing pretty well and the potential he has, we've all seen it, he's still quite raw but only what, 22 years of age? Was someone who definitely still has a lot to offer and obviously the signing of Vida has kind of bombed him out but it'll be interesting to see what happens with that come the summer because at the minute he's firm third choice, I don't even know if he was on the bench at the weekend but he's That's just a guy I feel sorry for at the minute because he's, he's, he's barely playing yeah, barely on the bench, you know. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, two start... goals against Hibs in the fifth to eighth of December, somewhere on that weekend. Yeah, was the last time we seen him. But yeah, you say six 0 thing against Aberdeen. He was very good off the bench in that game from memory. Yeah. Um, a goal, goal against against Ross County. <laughs> yeah, a goal yeah. against St Mirren. The winner against St Mirren was crucial that game. Yeah, comes off the bench, makes a difference. So he's someone who has a bit to offer, and with with consistent minutes and development. He could do well because he's look, look at that, still only 22. Yep, contracts until 2028. Listen, I think he, he still has a lot to offer. I really rate him, and but he does a better option at the minute. But I do feel sorry for him. You think he's maybe getting a bit of development on the training pitch and stuff because he's a like is yeah. quasi bottom end Premier League guy, yeah. you know, like so yeah. slightly different standards, training practices, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a development opportunity for him, perhaps, which I know he, you know, these guys want to be playing, especially the goals he scored, important goals like you were highlighting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I won't take that as much of a constellation, but yeah, maybe 
you know, maybe the O develops into being yeah, back up. Yeah, again, but yeah, it'd be good to see because we've seen what he can do before, and he's a guy who, especially when he comes off the bench, I feel he's more effective uh, when he when he comes on in games. And I, I feel I just feel sorry for him because he's been totally. It's similar to like, it's kind of like O and home. Yeah, and Kelly yeah. versus yeah. Bernardo and Ida, isn't it? You know, yeah. like mm-hmm. we've got some yeah. guys that are kind of the same guy, but a few years younger. And then yeah. these guys who are in on loan are the yeah. same guy, but like yeah. two years older, you know. <laughs> yeah, two years older and a bit further ahead in their development as well, because you're not getting the same impact from a Kelly, from a home like you're getting from Bernardo. And yeah. it's the same with the O and the Ida situation. So potentially, maybe the Bernardo and the Idas are the stop gaps until the likes of the Homes and the O's and the Kellys are at that stage where they can come in and contribute to the team. Yeah. Definitely some good food for thought on that. Maybe for the bench rather than the starting eleven for this weekend, because the bench will be, you know, will be important to this game. You know, and for me right now, I'm Forrest over Palma, no problem at all. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Forrest, if he could get his shooting boots back on, like he knows mm-hmm. Scottish football inside out. I know he's not quite at the same pace as before, but like, you know, you know he's got to pass it to someone if there's a tap in there to be had. He doesn't shoot from fifty yeah. yards, and <laughs> he can he can beat a man, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I love Forrest for the bench if he's got shooting boots together. Yeah, yeah, I think Forrest is someone who can come on and contribute to the game in the last 10 minutes. Let's see if you're chasing a goal. You can bring him on. Now, he might not score the goal, but he can create a chance like you're saying. He could easily skin a Barisic, even though he's about 32, 33. He could easily send him, let's be honest, and get to the byline. Whereas Palma, he's not really at full fitness. Do you risk him putting him on the bench for the game? So Forrest goes on the bench, definitely. Him and Yang are two viable options. Um, out in, in the wide areas off the bench for me and Forrest is reliable a lot of people listen I know a lot of people don't rate him and I, I can understand that at times but you can see what you can do he's he's a top top professional as well Brendan always Brendan wouldn't say he's the best winger at the club for no reason so he sees him every single day he knows what he can do and Yang's just someone who's hungry and has a lot to offer in terms of just continually running and his opponent being effective coming inside they can go on the outside as well and Palma, he's kind of he's going to see when Palma's fully fit between now and the end of the season. He's going to have a hard job getting back into this team. Well, you look at Kuhn on form, Maeda. Palma's going to Palma's going to have a tough job. Yang as well. Like you're just yeah. saying, Forrest, it's it's going to be tough for him. And he's someone who in the first half of the season was a key player. Like scored two goals in the Champions League, scoring the the goal away at Motherwell to put his one 0 up. The game eventually one two one. His numbers actually this season are pretty good. But he does frustrate a lot of fans. Like even when you're watching him try to cut inside, he just runs into traffic. And do you want someone who's gonna frustrate you even more when it's a game at Highbrook playing? Maybe not. So Forrest is potentially a better option there. I was just thinking as well back to the the first Ibrox game we had this year that I thought Yang was pretty. Yeah, he didn't do much, but he was you know up for it and he gave yeah, them yeah. some problems. <laughs> I just went and looked at the game. So this was the last time we played at Ibrox in the league this year. Uh, I yeah. think this was back under the last management of memory serves me right. So. Bit of a slightly uh, lagger BLK doesn't appear on this because he gets sent off, didn't he? So, like, it's just a mad glitch in this. I don't think I started. Did, was Lager that game? did Lager BLK get sent off? That That is that game, but I don't know if I don't think Lager BLK get sent off. Oh, no, Lager BLK didn't get sent off in this game, but he's not on screen for this. It's just a Lager BLK glitch in general. Yeah. I thought it was <laughs> the red card. Sorry, I yeah. beg your pardon, everyone. Yeah. But, um, but I, th- this team was very passive. They let McGregor have the ball, you know, which was really weird yeah. at the time. And yeah. I remember Yang on for Abada and thinking that that really like put the cat amongst the pigeons. Yeah. In terms of like you know what he was doing, I know it didn't really amount to much equally. Um, but again, like if we've got Vickers back in the back four of the mid, you know, like we had Turnbull in this game play sixty six minutes with Odin home coming on for twenty four. So yeah. I, I do feel coming into this one, they will be very different. Of course, totally different manager and play style, but I do feel that you know equally, you know we we are. And much better, Nick. And I think, like as far as derbies go, Josh, I don't know how many years I'd want to put on it, but it's definitely the most important derby in yeah. a number of years at yeah, this I point. Think, because, yeah. like we, we were talking about it before coming on, I think this is must win. I think a draw or anything worse, sadly, is unthinkable at this mm-hmm. stage of the season. I think yeah. we need a win to kind of, yeah. uh, you know, right our sins of previous games gone by. Yeah, it feels like that's the case with derbies, though. We said that in the new year when we need to right our wrongs, and it looks like it's the same. Uh, this time around going to Ibrox. Um, listen, I, a lot of people say it's a must win. I would, I don't know, people let us know in the comments, Bob, I'd be happy with a draw at Ibrox. Unless it's a draw where 
we've conceded two goals in the last 10 minutes from to being 2-0 up or 1-0 up and we can see the last minute equaliser, I'd take a draw right now because, OK, we're one point ahead, right? The draw stays at one point. Rangers go two points ahead. I'd be pretty confident going into that game after the split at Parkhead, needing to win to win the league. I'd be pretty confident in the team there. But I definitely I would want a win because it just gives you that extra leeway, makes you more comfortable. As well, just the mental side of things, that could really boost the team on if you win the game to go on and win this title, especially how close it is. I'd say uh, in terms of title, yeah, it's one of the biggest derbies in years. But at the same time, obviously we had the cup final last year, so that was massive. And you had, I think, two year, two years ago, just the game I referenced earlier, where Vic, Car Vickers scored. A lot of people forget, see the title race that season, and just first season, it was pretty close. I think Celtic only ended up winning it by four points. So it's still, it was, it was a t- tough, t- tight one last then. But Celtic just had that momentum where you could just tell they were going to eventually win it. This season, both sides are probably worthy winners at this stage. I don't remember quite how that season finished, but I do think we were like 10 ahead or something. I think we wrapped yeah. it up and then we were yeah. on cruise control and yeah. they, they they closed the gap ever so slightly. Maybe we drew with them and I, I can't remember the full details of it. But I remember thinking as time goes on, that may be remembered a bit oh. differently because we did we did close it out quite oh. uh, quite well, yeah. I thought. Yeah. Although it wasn't that, as, you know, it wasn't like 20 points clear. Or anything yeah, yeah. Like that, you know, but yeah, uh, we no, won I'm, it. I'm with you on that. But it's with this, mate, Champions League football's guaranteed this year. Yeah. So that's, that's when thing. I was growing up, those were the title races that was like blood, yeah. sweat, and snorters and thunder yeah. and everything in yeah. between, you know, helicopters and everything. And when you see the referee appointment that we've got for the weekend, oh, know. you know that they're pulling out all the stops. I've got yeah. no confidence. If they yeah. were two points ahead, like imagine the worst happens or we draw. Yeah. If they're, if they're two points or more ahead in the last game, they, you know, they're, they're going to referee it up again, aren't they? I know, and that's... They, it, you know, screws out. I think it's, yeah, the referee appointment is just a sticking two fingers up at Celtic, isn't it? John Beaton. Uh, getting this game, he's the man Rogers publicly criticised. It's just a message from the SFA that this guy is competent. Look what he'll do in this game. What he's realistically going to do in this game is ten minutes in penalty to Rangers. But listen, we don't know. We don't know. I'm not going to say. Stuff How many like penalties that. will they get? It's probably better than score predictions oh, for this podcast. How yeah, many penalties will Rangers get? I don't know. Listen, I think the last one they got against us was the New Year derby under Ange, the two each game where Kyogo scored at the last minute. Uh, that was the last one they got. And Beaton was the referee that day. So, listen, if they get one again this time, I don't know, patterns of, patterns of assistance is what's going about on Twitter at the minute, I've seen. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm not one to be a conspiracy theorist and all this, but there's some things you notice that just, I don't know. I, I generally don't know. Willie they call really hard to explain. Yeah. <laughs> It's hard. So I'm yeah. not going to come on here saying the SFA against Celtic, all oh, this rubbish. But unconscious bias, John Beaton, Rangers fan, refereeing one of the biggest derbies in a while. Don't know what anything could happen, couldn't it? Yeah, big thing. And it feels like, uh, I've seen somebody saying about the guy who's leaving at the end of the season, the, the referee of the VAR guy, it's like he's going out oh, for a bag on this one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. So... I hope they don't influence the match. And I think, like, hopefully, like, uh, because P- Kyogo should have had a penalty against Livingston. It's a penalty all day long. Yeah, VAR yeah. took three seconds on it and said, nah, put it in the bin. Couldn't yeah. believe it. Um, yeah. And I think that's that's a huge driver, I hope. Because that's what Celtic, like, again, when again when I was growing up in these kind of title races, you have to be so good that the ref can't screw you out of it. You know, yeah. you have to put two clean goals in, and then yeah. when they try and... Help, the, help them back into it or give you some bookings or time waste here and there or whatever's going on that they can't, you know, because like I say, Rogers has never spoken about refs before. That was very unusual for him because Rogers and like all good managers, you've always got to put the onus on yourself, you know, and like you've got yeah. to take the, the game out of the control of the referee. And yeah. I think if we play like that, then that's hopefully the best version of us, but it's got to be like, you know, no, no room for error. Don't think that, oh yeah, because we've had three chances in the first 10 minutes, that'll keep coming. If we've yeah. not scored one of them, you know, you need to make sure we fucking get in the back of the net every chance we get because you don't know what's going to happen yeah. uh, with the next time the whistle blows, what, who it's for or where it is, or, <laughs> you know. As, as Jock Steen said, if you're good enough, the referee shouldn't matter. And if Celtic are good enough at the weekend, what John Beaton does won't come into consideration. But there's no getting away from some of the dodgy decisions. It's a stonewall penalty. There's clear contact. 
see Chris Boyd on half time in the punditry. No, I, I didn't watch it live on Sky, but I've seen some clips of it. And Wild. Yeah, it's just it, how him, how he gets to be a pundit on mainstream television, Sky Sports. Should you should have someone who I think Robert Snodgrass dealt with him really well actually in the situation, but they, they should have someone who's much more just just not like he's not a bigot, right? But just not on there to noise people up and who's actually going to be analytical and critically think about decisions and make sensical judgments, unlike Chris Boyd, who just makes judgments based on bias. But I don't know. It's it's a still more penalty. I don't know if it's to do with the angles VAR had on the challenge, because when I've seen some of the angles, I can see why it wouldn't be a penalty, because you can't really see the clear contact. But when you see some of the other camera angles, it's a still more penalty. So maybe I don't know if there's an issue with that. We've seen that being a problem before when they played Motherwell uh, last season, and there was a Jota goal that was disallowed for offside, and it should have been well on, uh, just because the, the way the camera was facing, VAR gave it off. So I don't know if that was an issue at the weekend. But if they had the angles... In every angle, I don't see why they can't give a penalty. See, the thing as well is, right, see with our players, yeah. I don't think any of them have got reputations as divers or simulators. No, the, only one, you know. the only one I think I can imagine is among opposition fans, not among Celtic fans, among opposition fans, Kyogo has got a bit of a reputation as a diver. You know, speaking to fans. He's soft. Looking on he doesn't... Flat. Yeah. He's not, like, asking for stuff. Like, oh, that was a mad foul. He just... Yeah. He just, goes just get back up. Yeah. I know. The only... Listen, I can see why some fans think he's a bit of a diver and something like that, because there was one under Ange first season but Ayo Obelai at home to Livingston slaps him in the back of the head and he goes down like I saw and we get the penalty and Jack Marcus misses it. So I can see why some people can see him in that way. But you look at him, see when other opposition players are down, he's the first person around them helping them up. He's by no means a, a pantomime villain. He's a good guy who, like you say, is just a bit soft, isn't he? Aye, big time. Because when you see these, like Maeda is probably the most, is probably the most uh, ripped off player foul wise from referees in the league. Like, because yeah. he, he just gets up and gets on with it afterwards. And like, I think this first, you don't really see it too much this year, but the last two years, you would see his face looking at referees, like, how are you, or you gave that against me? Like, what's going on? You know, and it's just always like quite meaningless fouls in the game out in the wide left or here or there yeah. or whatever. But it's, uh, but we definitely don't, you know, when the VAR kicks in, I don't, I can't imagine how they think, oh, that, that keel goes at it. Because it's not as if we get, like, contentious decisions go our way, and then you look at it in the aftermath and go, oh, that dies in Maeda's con the ref there big time, or, you know, whatever. All yeah. the referee controversies normally, like, VAR-related decisions, like, oh, they shouldn't have gave that. That was, you know, they've done that. That's too soft. Yeah. Or they have not done that. That was just stupid. Yeah. It's not like, the players are at it in any way. So when we do get those 50-50 calls, I always it just blows my mind how like of course he's been hit. It's cute. These guys aren't mad divers, you know, like yeah. even if the angle isn't perfect, you know, because like I say, they've been here for three years. They're not strangers, you know. And yeah. how often have they been done with simulation or how often are we talking about them as being actors? Yeah, I know it's I, I don't know where like, I can understand the Kyogo thing, but listen, it's like you say, they're honest guys and they're not trying to buy fouls. And I think the the time for trying to get decisions off referees and try to con them into stuff is over just because of VR and, and different things like that. I think it's very hard to, to dive or do something in the referee not to see it and it not to be picked up. I think those days are gone now. Because when you think of the back, maybe in the 2010s, the amount of kind of diving kind of con men you had, like Luis Suarez, had a big reputation for it. There's none, next to none of those types of guys, pantomime villains in football anymore that will do stuff like that because just because of VAR and the way football's went. I mean, some people like them. I'm a big fan of Luis Suarez, obviously. Like, even the handball against Ghana in the World Cup was as much as, see if you're a Ghana fan, you'd be raging, right? But see if, like, you just love to watch that as a neutral one. It's a shame that those days are gone now. But for Celtic, they're not divers. They're not weak cheats. Nothing to do with that. And I think a lot of the abuse they get, although I can kind of see what it comes from and what they're basing it off the evidence, I think it's just like, take a step back, look at your own team. Like, see fans of like Aberdeen and Hearts, like pure abuse in Kyogo. It's just like, lads, take a, take a look at your own team. When was the last time you used like challenge for a title or 
how many trophies have you won in the last like, 20 years? Focus on yourselves. Don't start criticising Celtic players when Kyogo scored several goals against those teams in the past. Yeah. I think before we can start with score predictions, Josh, we need to think about we're not getting a clean sheet in this game, are we? Or do we get a clean sheet? No, what do you think? I don't know. I don't know. It's, yeah, I, th- I can see Celtic getting a clean sheet. You look at the last visit to Ibrooks, clean sheet. There's nothing to say yeah. you can't do it again. And listen, the, with the defence, like we've said, it's very stable at the minute. I could see it happening, but if it does happen, you need everyone to be at the top of their game. You need Joe Hart to put in a big performance. Now, obviously, you've got the last start bait Parkhead uh, after the split, and we don't know how the Scottish Cup final, if Celtic are going to get there, if they're going to play Rangers in the final. So we might have three derbies to contest with between now and then. But Joe Joe Hart is going to have a big part to play this weekend. And in one of the last big games of his career, he's going to want to have a say, and he needs to if, if Celtic are to keep a clean sheet. It is possible. But I'd like to see what the bookies' odds are on it because I don't think it's very likely. Yeah, just for how likely they are to get a penalty, or even yeah. last time it was the last time at Celtic Park they scored that free kick. You know, so like, yeah, even mm-hmm. it's dead balls. It's just the main yeah. thing they're always worried about. A corner yeah. as well we could throw that into the mixture. Yeah. So I'm not too confident on it yeah. uh, overall. And then it's just you know like how do we think this, the game's going to roll out? I do think we've got like two goals in us, like in terms yeah. of just how the game might shape out. Some counter attacks, bit of quality here from. Somebody like O'Reilly or uh, Hitati, something like that. But depending on how the game goes, you know, we could score a couple more because if they keep, if we do, we did get a goal early enough and then they have to come out, it gives us yeah. the space we want to go and get more. So yeah. I, I do think we've, I, I, I would probably take a, a 2-1. I'm going to, I'm going yeah. to, I'm a 2-1 kind of mm-hmm. sitter here for right. this one. I'll take the victory. Hopefully it's more comfortable than 2-1. Hopefully it's like 2-0 and then maybe they get a consolation at the end. Mm-hmm. Or no, that would probably won't be too comfortable actually. So <laughs> I don't know. No, no lead. Ones, yeah, no lead that Ibrox is comfortable unless it's by three or four goals. Uh, yeah. So, in terms of score prediction, I don't. I honestly don't want to make one. It's one of those ones. I, I'll go with. I'll go with three two to Celtic. Uh, is, is, goals for you. Yeah, I think this could be a. This could be a classic. It's either going to be a classic where you get five or six goals, or it's either going to be like Man City v Arsenal at the weekend, but it's just cagey as anything. And both teams don't really want to come out over commit, and it could end up in a nil nil or a one nil or a one each, something like that. So I think I don't think there's either anyway about it. It's either going to be the the KG affair. It's going to be both teams going for it. One team maybe pumping the other. One team doing the same, or just a hopefully it's a really good game for the neutral. But as Celtic fans, you want to you want to win it comfortably, like you said. Yeah. Yeah, well, fair enough, mate. I'm with you all the way on there. It's uh, it's definitely a hard one to call, and it's a, it's a brave man that does it. But yeah, I'm going to go for 2-1. Yeah. Um, I was going to say if anyone's going to the game, but I don't think we've got the allocation, actually. Yeah. This game. All, that, all that stuff is next season, yeah. isn't it? The 5% yeah. stuff and whatever. So yeah. no one will be going to the game that's listening to this, I'm sure. So <laughs> wherever you're watching it, have fun. Stay mm-hmm. safe. Where, where will you be watching it, Josh? Yeah, I'll be watching it from the comfort of my own home. So ah, like, sure. Likewise. Yeah. Should be a good one uh, this Sunday. Thanks to everyone that's tuned into the podcast, but we've had a good one. And uh, yeah, more new hoops. Yep.